It was in the hit TV comedy series Ever Decreasing Circles that my next guest proved his reputation for comedy. As the suave, smooth, jack of all trades and master of all, Paul Ryan, with Richard Bryars and Penelope Wilson. It is, of course, one of the greats of British theatre, TV and film, Peter Egan. Thank you very much indeed for sparing some of your time, because I know you're a very busy man. Oh, it's music. a great pleasure to be here. Well, um, you were born in London, and um, you were the sign of a dog, weren't you? Born in the year of the dog. Uh, born in the year of the... Yes, I was born in the Chinese year of 1946. <laughs> yes, that's absolutely right, yes. Um, I'm not sure which breed, but it certainly was the year of the dog. Well, yes. um, we'll come back to that a bit later on. But uh, <laughs> you were the son of... A, um, your father was uh, from Dublin. He was indeed, And yes. your mother was from Battersea. That's right. Where, where, where did you live? Lived in what was um, known in the 50s as the unofficial capital of Ireland, County Kilburn, in North London. My father, as you say, was a Dubliner. He came over in the 30s with my grandmother, uh, just after the kind of depression in Ireland, and he met my mother. Uh, my mother was working in Woolworths in uh, Oxford Street, and he was a, um, a, a fire watcher. And um, they met and uh, got together and then... Uh, resulted in uh, four children. One, my, my brother, my first brother, uh, died uh, at six months, but I now have a sister and brother who uh, are both older than me. I'm the youngest, um, Anne and Michael. You um, went to school in um, Maida Vale. Maida Vale, that's right, St George's. St George's. St, St George's secondary mob, yes. And uh, um, you left at age 15. That's right. I didn't pass my 11 plus, so I only went to school from the age of 11 to the age of 15. As soon as I was 15, I left as fast as I could, yes. Did the um, Kilburn uh, area sort of help with, because of the, the accents? Because you're often related, sort of known for playing rather public school. That's right, things. yes. Did, uh, did uh, Kilburn help with that? Uh, it, it, it didn't. It... <laughs> Um, when I was about 15 and a half, 16, I heard Richard Burton for the first time and, and, and Dylan Thomas. And I loved Dylan Thomas's poetry and I loved listening to Richard Burton doing Under Milk Wood. So I listened to him a lot. So um, that kind of started to clean up my accent anyway, because I had a kind of North London Irish accent, a sort of a bit like that, you know, a bit sort of my, my father. Would, Peather, he used to call me. Peather, what are you going to do with your life? And I, when I told him I was going to be an actor, he didn't stop laughing for three days. Um, but uh, so, yes, I, I had a, a, an accent that was not quite placeable. Um, uh, but uh, when I started listening to, to Richard Burton, people used to think I was Welsh for a long time. Then I went to RADA when I was um, just before my 18th birthday. And of course, in those days, 1964, um, you, you were taught standard English. Yes, and that kind of. RPC, um, yeah, RP, received. RP, yes. now received pronunciation, as it's called now. And so uh, they, they, they cleaned up the sound that I make, and to the point where a lot of people thought I was about 39th in line for the throne. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. But. Um, you first got the taste after doing a sort of you worked in hospitals and uh, that's right. uh, various other odd jobs but you 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 understand you um suddenly got hooked in because you're a great drawer and do that's that, right aren't absolutely you? I am, and yes. um you got roped into helping with the set on, of an amdram that's right it was a, and what happened was there was a, 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 a a friend of mine was a film extra, and um, he sort of encouraged me to kind of uh, get copies of the stage newspaper. And uh, in fact, I, I had a very long friendship with our local news agent because I'd been a, a newspaper boy when I was a kid, when I was 11 and 12. In fact, I delivered Sean Connery's newspapers and Colin Blakely's and Mario Fabrizi, who was very big in the army game in the late 50s, early 60s. Um, anyway, so I got a copy of the stage newspaper and at the back I read an advert for a group in Ladbroke Grove, which was only a ten minute walk from, um, from Kilburn where I lived. And also it would seem to be kind of geographically within the territory that wouldn't bother me too much. If the group had been further afield, like in Chelsea or in Kensington or something, I might have been a bit intimidated. So I went along, in fact, to, to, to meet at this group, and, and I was quite good at drawing, as you said. And I said, you know, could I help in ter terms of design, stuff like that? And they said, yes, of course, um, they were looking for members. They were obviously desperate 
desperate for new members because they took me on. And um, in the first uh, three months of being there, they did a play called Arsenic and Old Lace. You played Teddy, I believe. I played Teddy Brewster, yes. <laughs> they couldn't cast... Charge! Me. Charge, absolutely, yes. It was a very, very funny character. And, uh, of course, I was about 85 years too young for the part because I was 16. And... Um, I, I had the opportunity of playing this um, this extraordinary eccentric character who buries bodies in what he thinks is the Panama Canal, which is in the basement of this house where these two old ladies, old ladies are murdering people. <laughs> very, very It's funny. a wonderful play. It's a very funny part. I played the body once. Oh, did you? Yes. Very and good it was, part. It was a good part. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I sort of died every night, really. But... Uh, um, <laughs> I think that also may have informed um, my, uh, my my pleasure in playing comedy because playing that part, um, every time I went charge up the stairs, it got a big laugh from the audience and uh, I thought, oh, this is rather nice, I rather like this. Um, so that was the moment I want to be an actor. Yes, there was a, that was, uh, that plus the fact, um, uh, as I said, I had a very bad education. Um, I, I, I'd read about two books by the time I joined this group. I remember one was Treasure Island, the other was Oliver Twist. They were the only books I'd ever read. And um, so I joined this group and I suddenly experienced people uh, talking in detail about how you interpret language in a play, you know, how you say lines. Um, and uh, they were using all kinds of words I didn't understand. And but I found that I was fascinated by it. And that's really where a kind of penny dropped for me. I thought, this is a, an environment I'd like to, 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 to live in, really, to work in. You uh, applied for five drama schools and were accepted to all of them. Amazingly, and yes. You, you went to... RADA, Rada. Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, yes. And uh, do, do you still keep in contact with any of your contemporaries? I do. There's a, 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 an actor called Paul Shelley, who uh, I've now known for ooh, um, um, nearly 50 years. Um, and, of course, Shane, who is uh, my oldest friend. Um, but he went to Bristol. I, he didn't go to, to RADA. Um, and there was an American um, actor-director called Tony Stimak, who, whenever he's in England, we, uh, we keep in touch. But Paul mainly... Your first television was uh, Seth... Um, how, how do you... Seth, Starkadder. Star Seth Starkadder, Star yeah. In the BBC Cold, um, Cold Comfort Farm. That's right, yeah. And he was obsessed with sex, wasn't he? Well, he was, he was obsessed with sex and also being a star. And um, it, it was a wonderful series. It's, um, uh, it starred Alistair Sim and Faye Compton. And Brian Blessed played my brother. And, um, yeah, it was a really uh, interesting and funny thing uh, to kind of uh, kick off my career. That was, I think, the first, also the first colour programme for BBC Two. It was in 1968, I think. Really? Yeah. Yeah. But that was swiftly followed by a very sort of cult uh, movie. Yes. Tell me about that and the scene. The scene, oh yes, OK. That's uh, you're obviously Big Breadwinner Hog. Um, and that was a series that I did in 1968, 69. Um, it was directed by Mike Newell and Mike Apted, who have gone on to become big international directors. Um, it was written by Robin Chapman, and it was basically a television series dealing with um, a kind of um, sort of grammar school boy, uh, uh, psychopath, who wanted to kind of take over the London underworld. I played this uh, psychopathic character called Hogg, and uh, there was a scene that was uh, very violent in which I had to throw acid in someone's face and Mike Newell filmed it very graphically and the whole reason behind that wasn't gratuitous it was in fact to show that um, if you do something violent it's going to hurt because in those days with the series like The Saint and stuff they were all using all balsa sort of, wood you know, yes, you know, the chairs they all broke and yes. nobody got hurt yeah. and what he was trying to say with this is, is that you know if you create a violent act then you're going to have a violent response and so he filmed it and he, there was a moment where the, uh, the, the character who received this unpleasant liquid um, his face almost sort of started to melt a bit on screen and it was yes very disturbing to see and questions were asked in the house questions were, were indeed asked in the house it was front of uh, most newspapers and I think one MP brought it up I think it was described as an, uh, an act of treason because this character Hogg was inciting the youth of England to violent dis uh, disturbance of some kind so yeah it was really a, a, a very dramatic um, entry into this profession. In 72, 1972 you won the best 
uh, Theatre Critics Best Actor Award yes. for yes. playing Stanhope in uh, Journey's End, Journey's yes. End which I, I think is a haunting, haunting play. Yes. Um, do you have any sort of memories of that or particularly? I just think it's such a, a amazing it's sheriff, R.C. Sheriff. R.C. Sheriff. sheriff. It's a, it is an amazing document about the First World War. It, all of it takes place in a dugout and so you see it very much, if you like, from the officer's point of view. You don't see it from the ordinary, the men as they call them, the, you know, the soldiers who were out uh, there um, getting killed daily. Um, but of course all the officers in, in, in uh, Journey's End all die as well. So it's um, very profound again. Um, uh, the thing I felt about that when I first started it, because of my if, for want of a better uh, image, my working class roots, I was most concerned that I could be accepted as a public school boy. Yes, and it is. Um, so th th that was the strongest um, uh, accolade to say that you've arrived exactly and the, to, to win Best Actor. I mean, that, uh, that's absolutely a great, great part to play. A great play as well. I thought it was, I really, really enjoyed doing it. And also, strange enough, it was the first production by Emma Thompson's um, father, Eric Thompson first play he ever directed, and he went on afterwards to be uh, a huge, internationally famous director. You've been a director. You was um, at the artistic director of the... Millet Sonning, Sonning. yes. Sonning. Opened, opened that in 1980, around there. Um, I, did, I did the first play in, at the Lyric Hammersmith when it reopened in the late 70s. I also directed um, Rattle of a Simple Man, which my wife, Myra, suggested I do with John Alton and Pauline Collins. We are great friends and we used to holiday together a lot in the 70s and 80s and indeed now. Um, and we were sitting around a, a pool in Spain somewhere in about 1978, 79, and we said, we, you know, we should all do something together. And I just directed this play and Myra said, you should do Battle of a Simple Man. And John rang back to London and within um, two days it was set up and um, came back and started rehearsing about three months later. You're very, very busy at the moment and um, I was very privileged to actually get a ticket for what? People, Alan Bennett's wonderful new play at the um, National Theatre, um, which is uh, running from now, um, from October uh, until um, May of next year. Great, wonderful piece of writing. He's a wonderful writer. And it's a great, great joy to do it. And I am delighted to be at the National. And who are you playing? It's hysterical. I play a man <laughs> called Mr. Theodore, who is uh, a filmmaker. What sort of he films make, he makes? He, sort of, he makes films of a questionable type. <laughs> and he, 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 it's porn, it's, actually. It's exactly, porn. it's porn, <laughs> pornography. And, uh, and he, he chances upon this um, uh, mansion and finds a way in and um, gets the space and, um, uh, and makes film there. Not so, so content with that, but to, to Christmas time, Christmas Day, yeah. um, we're going to see you uh, playing a character called... Shrimpy. In yes. what? In Downton Abbey, yes. Wonderful. That was, a, that was a nice... And I've had two great presents this year. One was Downton Abbey in the middle of the year and now um, people at the National. Um, and yes, Shrimpy is... Shrimpy Flincher, he's a, a great friend of the character that Dame Maggie Smith plays um, in Downton Abbey. And they, as a family, come up to Scotland. We filmed it in Inverary Castle, I think it was called, um, which is the, uh, the, the seat of the Duke of Argyll. Um, overlooking the biggest lock, um, I think it's Loch Finn, and or Loch Fine, um, and uh, it's a lovely character. Very fine legs. Very Indeed, very good. I do look good in the kilt. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, right at the start, I, I said that uh, you were born in the year of the dog. Indeed, yes. And the reason I mentioned that was that, of course, you are passionate about welfare for dogs and all things sort of... Animals in general, really, yeah. yes. Um, the, uh, in fact, the, I suppose the dogs are, are the, the kind of gatekeeper into the, uh, the great uh, commitment and passion I feel for animals in general, yes. Yeah. Dogs are the, are the beginning of it and it's now spread to um, uh, tigers, to bears, um, to rhinoceros. Uh, elephants and uh, animals that are uh, are being um, brutalised and are, a lot are on the verge of extinction. Yeah, I, I understand that um, in twenty years' time there aren't going to be any more tigers unless we. Well, 
Yes, I do mean, something uh, indeed. Now. David Shepherd with his uh, great organisation Tiger Time. Now, I mean, he says in in, in uh, the speech that he gives at, uh, uh, on various occasions that um, when he was born, there were something like eighty thousand tigers in the world. At the moment of time, there are three thousand two hundred wild tigers in the world, and in twenty years, indeed, if, if something isn't done, they will be extinct. And that's just a shocking thought. And it's something that I think that we would... I mean, if I am alive when my grandson has children and he says to his children, um, our ancestors allowed the tiger to become extinct, I would be deeply ashamed. And Jill Robinson, who founded um, Animals Asia. Animals Asia, yeah. as your great sponsor. Well, she is, I think she's remarkable. Um, she started Animals Asia, I think, in... Uh, in the middle 90s and uh, uh, her commitment is of course to the moon bears and the moon bears is, if you I mean what is so sad about all of these things is that I know that if the general public were aware of what's happening they would all support these organizations more um, because I tweet a lot about it and people say oh I didn't know this was happening um, she uh, went to a, a bear bile farm in China and uh, if people don't know what bear bile farms are the, uh, these beautiful moon bears, they're called moon bears because they have a crescent, a like fur, a piece of fur in the shape of a crescent moon across their chests. They're the most beautiful bears. They're kept in cages for up to 35 years. Their lifespan is only 35 years. Um, cages in which they can't move. Um, and, they, uh, and they have a port inserted um, which daily extracts bile from their gallbladder in the most horrific way. Uh, it's painful, it is uh, also unnecessary because um, uh, bile can be synthetically produced and it is uh, much more effective. So it's, uh, it's a disgusting uh, and horrific experience these bears uh, live through. Um, now, um, Jill Robinson uh, went into a bear bile farm in, in the 90s, was horrified by this, quite rightly, and she started Animals Asia. And they have uh, a sanctuary now in China and in Vietnam. Uh, the one in Vietnam is in, under threat of closure at the moment and needs a lot of support. Um, to make sure that doesn't happen and all of these things can be found if people who listen to this um, uh, Google Animals Asia they'll see all of the information. And you, as you said you do a lot of work on Twitter uh, making people aware, aware of, it. Absolutely. of, of yes. this and I, I know you do a lot of work with sort of charities such as Wet Nose. Wet Nose is, a, is, a, is a, uh, an organization that uh, uh, gives um, money to smaller charities, raises money, and gives money to smaller charities. Also, the, the Wet Nose Awards, which are once a year. Um, it's a marvelous organization, and it's run by Gavin and Andrea Gambi Bulja. Um, uh, they had started it and run it, and um, give it, they give awards to small charities throughout England and the world that do great work in animal welfare. It, it, it's one I'm very, very delighted to be attached to. Uh, another charity, a dog welfare charity is that you work for is Soy Dog Phuket. Can yes. you tell me um, about them? Yes, well they're an extraordinary char uh, charity in Thailand. I mean a, a thing that not many people know is that there is a huge industry in Asia in China, Vietnam, Thailand and Korea and it's the dog meat industry and in excess of two million dogs a year are brutalized and uh, killed horrifically for the table. Um, and there is a belief that uh, if the dog suffers an extreme pain um, before death, then it releases an enzyme that sweetens the meat. Um, so there is a, 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 just an appalling situation for these poor animals. Um, and Soy Dog Phuket, who work mainly in Thailand, are doing sensational work. And they're run by Jill and John Daly. Um, that's a charity which I support and also is a charity that I hope that anyone who watches this will support. I've sort of been led into this whole world of dogs, really, because I'm also a uh, trustee and chairman of a London-based dog charity called All Dogs Matter. And we're based at the bottom of Highgate Hill. And we rescue and rehome dogs, about 250 dogs a year, along the sort of, um, sort of North East London corridor. 
Um, and uh, I have uh, quite a lot of dogs myself. Uh, that my wife... we, we, I think we've got some photographs. Can we have some names? Indeed, and we'll, indeed. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, go through them. Fantastic. Okay, well, my oldest dog, and a dog who really, I suppose, opened my heart to all dogs in general, or all dogs matter even, and that's DJ, who is a spolly, a spaniel collie cross. And he's a beautiful dog, getting on now. He's in his 14th year. Also, I have a lurcher whippet called Finn. And he's, I got him in exactly the same time as, as DJ. They're both the same age. Then I have Megan, who is a staffy. Um, she was used as a breeder. When we got her, her teats were still full of milk. She'd obviously just been bred and then kicked out after her third litter. And she was on her belly for a week when we first got her. And now we've had her for just nearly three years. And she's a wonderfully confident dog now. I uh, also have a, <coughs> a, a black labby female called Cassie that we got from, we rescued from a puppy farm. That's another thing which you see, which oh. is dreadful puppy farms. Um, and finally, um, I, I have um, Pippa, who is a lovely blonde um, Staffy Lurch Across, and she's our latest dog, and she's just gorgeous and uh, ebullient and. Uh, and uh, Staffies have a, you know, a terrible name, you know, because people think they're vicious and aggressive. And in fact, in the old days, I think Staffies were called the nanny dog by the Victorians because they kept them in the nursery to look after the children. They oh, were, I didn't you know, know that. That's yeah, they that's, that's, that's be, have beautiful natures. And, and, and uh, Staffies really, more than anything, want to please people. Um, that's why I think they can possibly be turned by people a lot, because they, want to, they will try and please their owner. Here's a photo of a little dog that um, we picked up in uh, Tottenham High Street. Uh, um, this dog was kicked out because it had mange. Um, now mange is, is something that um, puppies pick up from their mothers um, and it can be uh, cured very, very easily. Most people don't think, it, it, they think it's a disastrous, contagious disease and it's not. This is what it looked like four months later. And that can happen just by giving the dog the right medicine. We have a bit of a falling in America on Robert's Full English Breakfast Oh, yes, show. Oh, nice, yes. And um, um, I think it got out that um, you were going very kindly to come and uh, have a chat yeah. here. And um, uh, one of our followers, or, or great tweeters, uh, asked uh, me to ask you uh, about some of the uh, video... Oh, the computer games, yeah, and, yes. And which, yeah. which was your favourite one that you've done? Um, I, I, well, I suppose the one that's um, most successful, it's very hard one to do, is the Forza Motorsport, where I, um, uh, um, I am the encouraging voice of uncle, if you like, who uh, someone takes up this game and they go through various tests, and as they uh, get better, I advise them as to um, w w what additions they can add to their portfolio. It's rather difficult to do because it's very um, vocally demanding. Um, so th that's quite interesting to do, just on, from the point of view that um, when you have described the cubic capacity of a certain car a thousand times and... Um, Paint and uh, dry uh, sort uh, of things. Exactly. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's highly technical kind of yeah. data that you're giving to the listener and to the player. Um, that has a demand which, when you get it right, is very satisfying. Here on Robert's Full English Breakfast mm. Show, we always like to sort of give our guests uh, something to remember it mm. by. I'm not going to give you one gift. Uh, I I'm going to give you two gifts. Um, oh, one, nice. one gift here is for a thank you for your huge amount of work and pleasure you've given so many people in the world of theatre as an actor. And thank you very much for that. But, well, thank um, you for this. Oh, it looks delicious. Uh, well, <laughs> have a good Christmas and Downton Abbey time to have it. I'll I have think. one when I watch it. Watch it. <laughs> but my other present is from the chief executive of Dogs Trust, uh -huh. Clarissa Baldwin. Oh, indeed, yes. And she sent you this message. Peter, this is a heartfelt message from all of us at Dogs Trust and indeed anybody involved in animal welfare. Thank you so much for all that you do to improve the lives of dogs, not only here in the UK, but I know around the world where it's desperately needed. You have a very busy life um, and you're very high profile and it does help us enormously to have the support of people like yourselves. Please don't stop and thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Clarissa, for that wonderful message, and I can assure you that I'm definitely never going to stop. Thank you very much. Peter Egan, thank you very much for coming on Robert's Full English Breakfast Show.